Mama always said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. That's right. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, I'm persuaded that it is in you also. What Paul is saying is, Timothy, you had a good grandma. You had a good godly mama. And they taught you right. And I saw what was in your grandmother. I saw what was in your mother. And I just believe they raised you right. I believe that, that, that you got this engrafted. The next verse tells him to stir up the gift of God that's in him, that was given to him by the laying on the hands of the presbytery. But, but look on, if you have your Bible, Flip over a couple pages and look with me at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13. I want to read four verses and we'll pray. You'll be seated. But I, I, I want to read these four verses because it tells us what Timothy learned from his grandmother and his mother. It says, Paul's writing to him and he says, But evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse. How many know that's true today? You got people saying, you know, my grandmother, all, my mama always said, my grandmother always said, it's not who you say you are, it's who you are. But the evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Verse 14, but watch this. But you, Timothy, must continue in the things you've learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. Now, we know where he learned some of this. He learned it from his grandmother. He learned it from his mother. And he says, no one remembering where you learned these things from. And verse 15 says, and that from childhood you learned these things. So we know that he had a grandmother, he had a mother who taught them the right things. And, and, and you can read down through here really quickly and you can see uh, what he learned, what she taught him. He, it says in verse 15, and from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures. Somebody say the word. Yeah, that, what did his mom and daddy teach him? I mean, his mom and his grandmother, they taught him, you need to respect the Word. You need to know the Word. The Word will work if you'll work the Word. The Word's important. The Word is, it, it guides our steps. It, I've already said that multiple times today. And he says, uh, you've learned from childhood to know the Holy Scriptures, to know the Word, which are able to make you wise. He says, not only do you need to know the Word, they taught you wisdom is important. Somebody say wisdom. Yeah, wisdom's important. You know, there's a lot of things in life that, that we think is the problem, but the problem, is not what, the problem is not what we think the problem is. The problem is a wisdom problem. A lot of times the reason that, that we're unhealthy, it's not because of a health problem. It's a wisdom problem. You can't treat what you don't diagnose. You just need to have wisdom to know what the problem is to be able to how to adjust the problem. It's not a financial problem. It's a wisdom problem. Come on, somebody. If you look in this book, you'll find that there's wisdom. There's wisdom. If you will fix your finances, it's right there. If a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. Come on, y'all are a quiet bunch today. So she taught him the word. She taught him wisdom. And watch this. You've known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. So she taught him that the word's important. Wisdom's important. Salvation is important for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So so Paul's saying, Timothy, your mama, your grandmother, they taught you some things. They taught you to honor and respect the word. They taught you that wisdom is important. They taught you that salvation is important, and it's important to walk by faith. And 16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for good work. If you want to do good work, you need to be equipped to do good work. And if you're going to be equipped to do good work, the equipment is you know that the Word, wisdom, salvation, and faith are the equipment that allows you to do the work of God. Now, that's a sermon in itself, but don't y'all leave yet. I got more. But all that is the truth. Now, I don't know if you were raised in church, if you're godly mother, you had a godly mother or grandmother who raised you in church. I was blessed to have both. I had a godly grandmother, and I had a godly mother, and they both taught me these kind of things. And if you had that, you need to thank God for that. If you didn't, you need to become that. 
for your children and for your children's children. And God has a plan for our life. Today I'm going to preach a message. I, I had somebody this past week, they said, Pastor, I just, I've really enjoyed these messages on the end times. It's so deep. It's so rich. I said, well, don't expect that Sunday. Because today I'm jumping a little bit, and I, of all things, you've th seen there's a theme around here today. A few weeks ago, we were talking about Mother's Day, and I just told the staff, I said, I think I know what I'm going to preach. I've been wanting to preach this for 30 years. I didn't realize, but the movie that we've been, you've seen little drops of today, Forrest Gump, that movie was made, now some of y'all about to feel old, 1994. Now y'all about to feel older, because that was 30 years ago. 30 years ago, there was a movie and, and that movie, I'm going to suggest, if you go home and watch it, try to find the edited TV version. Because when I saw it, that's what I saw. And I loved the movie. I went back to watch it. I watched the unedited version. I thought, I shouldn't watch that movie. <laughs> but if you can find an edited version, it's really a brilliant storyline. And so today, there's, there's a few things uh, in that movie. There's a few lines that you probably are familiar with if you've ever seen it or heard about it. Forrest sat on that bench, you know, Forrest Gump, and the whole story, if you've not seen it, the whole movie, is Forrest sits on that bench, different people come to that bench, and he reminisces over his life, which is a crazy journey of life. And all throughout the movie, he says, Mama always said. Well, there's nine different things in that movie that Mama always said. I'm going to take three of them today, and that's going to be my points for this message. And so when I told that to the staff, all of a sudden, we got boxes of candy and a park bench and and a crazy announcement video, and so today the title of my message is Mama Always Said. Anybody got some of those of your own, some things Mama Always Said to you? Well, we're going to talk about a few of them from that, that film today, and I, then I'm going to go to the Bible. I'm preaching from the Bible, but we're going to use that as a starting place. Can we pray? Father, I thank you today for the Word of God. I thank you for the privilege to be in this house. Thank you, Lord, for each one that's gathered, for every mom that's here today. I pray your blessings on them. God, these next few moments, I can't. You never said I could. You will. You always said you would. Come in this place. Send your anointing that's powerful and effective and do what only you can do. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And you may be seated. Mama always said. I heard this story about um, these three brothers. They'd both done good. You know, they'd, made, they'd done well with their life, been very successful financially and their mother was getting up in age, and they thought, they got together one day, and one of the brothers said, what are we going to do for mom this Mother's Day? You know, she's getting older, she's getting some health problems, and I just want to bless her. He said, I've been blessed financially, been blessed this year, and I just want to do something really, really significant for my mother. One, the first brother, Eugene, he said, he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. He said, I just paid my house off. He said, I've got some money put back, more than I'll ever need. He said, I'm going to buy my mama a house. Let's buy, I'm going to buy our mom a house. And they said, wow, that's generous. He said, yeah. She's living in that little old house that she raised us in. He said, I'm going to buy her a house. I'm going to buy her a five-bedroom, four-bath, nice house in a good neighborhood. She'll never have to worry about crime or any of that gated community. They said, man, that is, that is generous. The second brother, he said, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I, I've been so blessed this year, I was able to buy me a brand-new Bentley to drive. He said, it's more than you should ever spend on a car. He said, but, man, it's so nice. He said, you know what, mom needs a car like that. I got enough money put back, it won't even hurt me. I'll go buy her a new Bentley. The third son, Stephen, he said, you know, he said, I didn't think of all that. He said, I, I kind of got this different idea. He said, I know mom loves to read the Bible, but she can't see well these days. She can't, she can't read because her sight's so bad. And he said, I, I decided I was going to buy her this special parrot I heard about. This parrot was down at the monastery. It's been there for 10 years, and the monks at the monastery have taught this parrot the entire Bible. This parrot can quote the Scripture. And he said, all you got to do is tell it the verse, and Mom can't read the Bible, so I got this parrot. thought it would be a great idea. All she has to say is, John 3, 16, the parrot will say, for God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. He'll quote any Scripture. They said, man, that is amazing. So they all three gave their mom the gift for Mother's Day. Later, she writes a letter to them all, thanking them for Mother's Day, their gifts and all. She writes the first son, Eugene. She says, Eugene, you bought me this house, and I know you meant well, but I, I can't see well. I can't clean this whole house. I only live in two rooms of the house. Why in the world did you buy me this big old house? I was fine in the house that I had. I don't even know how to get around this house. I, I don't understand why you would buy me such an extravagant gift. She writes to the second son. She says to him, 
to Gary, she says, why in the world did you buy me this car? You know I can't see. I, I can't drive. The car I had was fine. It was too much. I can't even see where I'm going. She wrote to the third son. She said, she said to uh, Stephen, she said, I, I'm just telling you, your, your brothers, they meant well. I don't know what they were thinking. And I, I just appreciate you being practical. And the, by the way, the son that bought the parrot, in order to get the parrot, he had to give the monastery $100,000 a year for 10 years to get this parrot. That was the commitment he made. And she said, I, he, she didn't know that, but she said, she said, I just appreciate the gift that you gave. It's so practical. It made sense. And that chicken was delicious. Yeah. Be careful what you give your mama. So here's some stats I looked up. I, I didn't know what I'm about to share with you. I had no idea. 84% of Americans celebrate Mother's Day. 84% of Americans celebrate Mother's Day. On this day, Mother's Day, there will be $31.7 billion spent on mom. That's a lot. That's almost a lot of money right there. $37 billion will be spent today on mom. It's the second biggest giving holiday of any holiday except for Christmas. $37 billion worth of gifts will be given and spent on mothers. Uh, I remember years ago I was preaching a Church of God camp meeting in West Virginia. And I remember that, that evening I was opening up the service and, I, and I'm getting ready to preach. And I, I stood there, they knew, all knew I was from Alabama. And I said, you know, I appreciate West Virginia. Thank you all for giving us that football coach you gave us. You know, that's where Nick Saban's from. And so they didn't, they, they were worse than y'all. They didn't even respond. They just kind of groaned about that. But, but then later I learned, this lady came up to me after service. She said, do you know what West Virginia is responsible for? I said, no, ma'am, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't have any idea. She said, West Virginia is responsible for Mother's Day. I said, really? I didn't know that. She said, yeah, there was a, a lady by the name of Anna Jarvis who started Mother's Day. And she told me all about it. I looked it up. Anna Jarvis, the, the interesting thing about Anna Jarvis is she, she, uh, was, she was not a mother. She never married. She never had children. But yet she started Mother's Day. And the way she started it is when her own mother died, they were at the graveside, and she gave every mom that was there at the graveside, this was in 1908, she gave every mother at the graveside a carnation because her mom's favorite flower was a carnation, so she handed out a carnation to every mom that was gathered at the graveside. And then several years later, uh, in 19, um, 1914, because of her persistence, Mother's Day became a national holiday in the United States of America. So there's some wisdom for you. Anna Jarvis in West Virginia, if it hadn't been for old Anna, we wouldn't have Mother's Day today. So you ought to thank Anna Jarvis. So when I was planning for Mother's Day, you know, usually, um, usually I'll have Kim speak on Mother's Day or sometimes we'll have a lady that'll speak to the moms on Mother's Day. And I looked at the calendar and I knew I was going to be gone last Sunday. And if I didn't preach today, y'all would think, well, what do you need him for? So, and by the way, uh, Brother Joel did an awesome job last Sunday. Awesome, awesome job. Appreciate him. Uh, so I knew I was going to be preaching today, and I thought, well, I think when I was trying to think of what to preach, I thought there, there is a, a message that I have wanted to preach on. I've wanted to preach on this title for 30, I've only been preaching for 29 years, but for 29 years I've wanted to preach this on Mother's Day, and I've never done it. So I'm going to preach today on Mama Always Said. Now, I went and I, I, I searched through that movie and I realized there are nine different sayings that Forrest Gump says, Mama always said, and it follows. There were three of them that stood out to me. Now, I, but what I discovered is, out of all of those Mama always said phrases, I thought Forrest Gump's mama must have read the Bible. Because every one of them that I read, I realized there's a scriptural, biblical basis to every one of those things that she said. Now, the very first one I'm going to give you is the very most popular saying that if you've ever watched that movie, then you know this phrase. You're going to be able to say it with me. Mama always said, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. That's right. Life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. And I thought about that, and I thought Forrest Gump's mama 
must have read the Bible. Because when I think about that phrase, I realize how true it is, and Paul writes about it. Romans chapter 8, verse 38, watch this. It says, Paul said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, or any powers, neither height nor depth, depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now, there's a hundred other scriptures that bears out the fact of what Forrest Mama said about a box of chocolates. There's no telling what you're going to get. Every day is different. Every day is unique. There's a hundred scriptures that bear witness of that. Life is filled with uncertainty. We do not know what each day holds. We just don't know. I, I don't know what today is going to unfold. I don't know what tomorrow is going to unfold. The, life is uncertain. There's an old hymn that says, I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. I know it's in his hand. I don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. It's uncertain. When I woke up this morning, I didn't know what I would face. I didn't know if I would get a phone call that I didn't want to get. I didn't know if something would change. I mean, all of us have had those moments where you get up at the beginning of the day and you don't know what that day is going to bring you. Sometimes it's tragedy. Sometimes it's triumph. Sometimes it's a battle. Sometimes it's a victory. You just don't know. Every day is unique and you wake up and you begin your day and it's filled with uncertainty. Every day is a reset. What Paul is saying here in the text that I just, or the verses I just read you in Romans is this. What he's saying is, yeah, we don't know what we're going to face. We don't know what tomorrow's going to be like. We don't know what today's going to uh, going to hold. As a matter of fact, I was thinking uh, as I was preparing this message, my mom. This is my first Mother's Day without my mother. She passed away in June, and I was thinking about on June 25th how on that morning of June 25th of 2023 of last year, I was just going about my day, and I get a call from my sister. My sister says, "Hey, mom has had a stroke this morning." She's in the floor. The ambulance is on the way. I was just able to resuscitate her, but she's not responding. And that one phone call, our family's life, without any expectations of getting that call, without any expectation, my mom was scheduled to come and stay with us for a few days with my stepdad, and boom, just like that, everything changed. You never know what you're going to get. This week, I got the call of a, a really a young man who had a heart attack and died. Young family. Just like that, everything changed. Not just for him, but for his whole family. One moment, that family woke up not expecting that their whole world would be changed in one moment of uncertainty. Now, there's other things that happen like that that you don't expect. It could be a, a letter in the mail. I know I've, I've got this thing on my email where I can check and see what mail is coming that day. And uh, the other day I looked at it and it said, you got a letter from the IRS. All day long, I couldn't eat. Come on. I don't like getting letters from the IRS. And uh, I got it and it was nothing. It was, just, it was just like an update on something. But all day long, I'm like worried over this letter from the IRS. What am I going to do? I mean, I, I believe that people in prison need prison ministry. I don't want to be the one to do it. Come on, y'all not from the inside, and I'm like, you just trust people, you just like, I pray, I pray everything's right, but I got it, everything was okay, it was cool, I'm, I'm good, amen, I hope, <laughs> I was good with that letter, you know, but it's uncertainty, and, and, and those things come, and, and watch the way I immediately reacted when I saw it from the IRS, you know what I did, I immediately thought the very worst, I'm going to owe money, that I, I, I don't, I'm like, man, I got to pay the IRS more money, and all it said was your return has been accepted. But, but it scared me to death. You ever been there? Maybe not just that, but something that just you don't know what to expect. And so your mind automatically goes to the worst. Well, here's what Paul says. Paul says that regardless of what you face, when God is with you, nothing is going to separate you from him. And if God is with you, David said, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I won't have to fear evil because God's with me. And no matter what you face, no matter how uncertain life is, if God's with you, he's the God of the good times. One songwriter says, he's the God of the good times, he's the God of the bad times, he's the God on the mountain, the God in the valley. Come on. He's God. No matter what you're going through, he's going to be there with you. So life is uncertain. We never know what we're going to get. But here's what we have to do. We have to control our mindset 
regarding how we approach those things. The Bible says, whose report will you believe? I mean, if you believe the report of the world, everything's falling apart. If you believe the report of the Bible, everything's coming together. So whose report do you believe? The Bible talks a lot about our mindset, about our thinking. The Bible says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Amen. Stinking thinking creates stinking people. Amen. If you, if you get your mindset right, amen, there's, there's people that say, you know, uh, into every life a little rain must fall. And somebody will say, yeah, and you'll leave your windows down in your car every time it does. You know, and somebody says, you got to stop and smell the roses. And somebody else will say, yeah, but I got allergies. It causes me to sneeze. You know, there's always, some people, some people find a solution for every problem. Some people find a problem in every solution. So you got to decide on how do you approach this. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Yeah, life's like a box of chocolates. You don't know what you're going to get. Life is uncertain. But how do you respond to those things in life that come against you. Ephesians 3.20 says, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Watch that. Unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Amen? The Bible says that, that, that we, are to, we are to deal with this thinking thing, this mindset thing. But, you know, I thought about this. Uh, Kim and I were talking. I said, you know, there's a lot of people that they believe in prayer, but their thinking's all messed up. You know, I, I thought about it. If, if, if you're trusting God for your marriage and you're praying for it, okay, you, you just really want God to fix your marriage, and so you start praying for your marriage situation. And so you spend an hour every day praying. Now, that's significant, y'all. I mean, people don't pray for an hour like they used to. You know, we used to sing Sweet Hour of Prayer, that old hymn, and then it became just a little talk with Jesus. And so we, you know, to pray for an hour for your marriage, that's pretty significant. But, but what if you spend an hour, a whole hour, every single day praying for your marriage, but then the other 23 hours of the, that, that day, your mind is saying they ain't never going to change. She's never going to change. He's never going to change. It's never going to get better. Then what good does it do to pray for an hour if for 23 hours your mind's not right? The Bible says in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, what things soever you desire when you pray, believe you receive them and you shall have them. You've got to get your thinking lined up with your prayer. Your prayer is petitioning God, but what a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Your mindset has to align with your prayer. You have to believe what you're asking God for. That's why Romans 12 and verse 2 says, tells us, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. Well, how are you transformed? By the renewing of your mind. It starts right here because what, it, what you allow to get in your mind gets in your heart. Now listen, I understand the sovereignty of God. I understand that, that you can't just magically think things into existence. But I'm going to tell you, you think yourself sick, you'll be sick. You think yourself broke, you'll always be broke. You think yourself sad, you'll be sad. I like what Paul says when he stood before Agrippa. And he was standing before the king. This is in Acts chapter 26 and verse 1. Agrippa is standing before the king. He's about to lose his life. I mean, Paul is being prosecuted for preaching the gospel, and he is guilty. And he stands before King Agrippa, and the first words out of his mouth are, I think myself happy. He's in prison. They're about to take his life. He's standing before the king, he's standing before the judge, and he says to himself, I think myself happy. Now in that moment, that's a hard thing to do right there. But your mind, and I'm not just this morning here to preach some inspirational message on, 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 on positive possibility thinking, but I am telling you that if you can get your minds right, your heart gets right. Because the Bible says as a man thinks in his heart, and you can't think it in your heart till you get your mind transformed. Amen? Yeah. So Psalm 118 and verse 24, and, and I, I, I did this a little, what I'm about to share right here, this little portion was my, our staff meeting this past week with our church staff and our team, and, 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 and it got in my spirit so much I thought, I'm going to make it part of this point right here. 
Because Psalm 118 and verse 24, the psalmist David says this. You've heard this verse. It's, it's, it's well known, well quoted. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Now watch this. Yesterday is gone. Tomorrow isn't here yet. All I have is today. That's all I got. Yesterday's behind me. Tomorrow's in front of me. All I can deal with right now is today. And the Bible said, David said, this is the day. Come on, somebody say, this is the day. Yeah, this is the day that the Lord has made. Whatever today brings, I have to make a choice that today is the day. This is the day. So how do I do that? Glad you asked. Here, here's how you do that. I'm going to give you just four things real quickly. Number one. If you're going to make this the day and you're going to, you're, going to, you're going to recognize today's the day, this is the day, first thing you got to do is you got to own the day. Somebody say, own the day. That means you got to take responsibility for it. I'm trying to lose weight. I went into our cafe this morning before church started, early service. I was the only one in there. I walked in there. I said, I'm going to have, now this is going to sound frou-frou to y'all, but I'm on a diet. I said, I'm going to have a sugar-free vanilla latte with almond milk. That sounds healthy. And I'm standing there at the cash register. I said, give me one of those honey buns right there, too. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Every little bit counts. And I thought to myself, I could lose weight if they'd quit selling those honey buns. Come on. I could lose weight if, if, if Krispy Kreme would quit turning that hot light on every time I drive by. I, I could lose weight. It's their fault. But no, it's not their fault. It's my fault. I've got to make the right, the right choices. By the way, I read recently, I, I was reading this in an article that I read that skinny people are more likely to be kidnapped. Come on. I have to protect myself, y'all. So, we got to take responsibility. This, this guy got pulled over for speeding. This guy got pulled over for speeding. He was swerving. The cop pulls him over, knocks on the door. The guy gets out. He said, sir, you were all over the road. He said, I need you to get out. And I need you to breathe into this machine here. I need to test your, your breath here, the alcohol level. And he said, oh. And he said, what? He said, I can't do that. He said, well, why not? He said, well, I'm extremely asthmatic. If I breathe into that like that, I could die. You don't want me to die. You don't want to kill me. The cop said, no, I don't, I don't want to kill you. He said, I'll tell you what, get in the back of my patrol car. We'll drive down here. We'll take some blood, and we'll do an we'll blood, alcohol blood test. He said, he said, oh. He said, what? He said, I can't do that. He said, why not? He said, I'm a hemophiliac. He said, if I do that, I could bleed out and die. You don't want to kill me. He said, no, I don't want to kill you. He said, i tell you what, just, just get out of the car, and I'm going to ask you to walk this straight line right here. The guy said, uh. He said, he said what in the world? He said, why can't you walk a straight line? The guy looked at him and said, because I'm drunk. <laughs> Come on. you got to take responsibility. The guy, so many people, you, you choose the outlook for today. The most determining factor of a person's happiness is based upon the outlook they choose. You ever been around somebody, they come into the room, and everybody in the room is quiet, it's, and they can come into the room, and, and they're just happy, and, and they just get on your nerves because they make everybody happy. You don't want to be happy, but all of a sudden you're smiling. You didn't want to smile, but you're smiling. Some of y'all today came into church because you came with your mama, and you're mad you're here. You just love your mama so much you came, and then you just laughed, and you're like, man, I just laughed in church. Didn't want to do that. I just enjoyed church for a second. But laughter does the heart good like a medicine, the Bible says. Amen? And so, so we, we, we have to understand that, that our outlook, you can also have people that can come into a room that's lit up and they can turn the lights off. Amen? you got to choose your outlook. Number two, you get, one, you got to own your day. Two, you've got to order your day. Somebody say order your day. Now, I know this is going to sound, this is, I know this is staff stuff more than it is preaching, but Man, it just, it, it blessed me, so I'm going to bless y'all. you got to have a plan for your life. I believe God is a God of order. Now, I believe God, God's a God of order. He's not going to do anything that's out of order. Now, God's going to always edify and build up. 
I, I said in the early service today, I just believe, you know, when I first started preaching, I was just raised that you just kind of got up in the pulpit, opened the Bible, opened your mouth, let God fill it. But, but I learned along the way that if I'm going to say something, I really need you. Don't, you don't know how many hours it may not seem like it, <laughs> but I've spent a lot of hours preparing this message. Now, I got up here and preached this morning, and a couple of times I went a different direction than I'll go today. You know why? Because the Holy Spirit leads according to the congregation. And so you follow that. But I plan, plan that out. Somebody said, Pastor, you just need to walk away from those notes and just preach what God gave you. I said, what God gives you. I said, I am preaching what God gave me. They're in those notes. If I step away from those notes, I'll preach what I want to preach. So we, God is a God of order. Every Sunday, we, we plan out what songs we're going to sing, when we're going to sing them, when we're going to receive the offering. And then we say, God, if you want to blow that up, blow it up. It doesn't matter to us. But we're going to be people of order. Come on, somebody. When you walk in here, things are going to be in order. The chairs are, you may not notice it, but all the chairs are going to have things in them and the chair, the rows are going to be straight and the, the room's going to be clean and the bathrooms are going to smell good. And we're going to, we're going to be a place of order because God is a God of order. Yeah. You don't believe that? Go over to Genesis chapter 1 and watch how he created this whole thing. He is a God of order. Now, now sometimes he comes in and it looks like disorder, but it's not disorder because God is a God of order. And what God does is he builds and he edifies. What he does sometimes is he messes up our order and he, he replaces it with his order, but it's always order. God is a God of order. and he, You have to have a plan for your life. You know, they don't sell a plane ticket based upon where you are. They sell a plane ticket to you based upon where you're going. When you buy a plane ticket, they don't sell the plane ticket to you the same price going to Atlanta as they do going to Germany. It depends on where you're going. Amen? And you've got to have a plan of where you're going. Can, can I just say this to you? Disorder is a time thief. Disorder is a time thief. Let me give you an example of that. I went through a season. I don't know what it was, but there was a season where I, lost, I didn't lose my keys. They were always right where I left them. I misplaced my keys, it seemed like, every single day. And I would get up. I would go, get up to come to the office, and I'd be kind of running late because I'm always trying to get everything done I can do before I have the next thing to do. And I'm trying to get all this done, and then I'm ready to go just on time to get to my next place, and I can't find my car keys. And I'm like, what did I do with my keys? And then I spend, no, I'm not going to ask you to lift your hand, but I know I'm not alone in this room, and I cannot find my car keys. And I'm like, Kim, what did you do with my keys? She said, I have not ever seen your keys. I'm like, well, I'm looking for my keys. I look for them. Then I find them. Now I'm 15 minutes late. And now I'm frustrated because I'm late and I'm having to drive fast and I get a speeding ticket and that costs me $100. And well, that's too much, isn't it? So it was like an everyday occurrence. I'm misplacing my keys. And then finally one day I got tired of that and we went and got us a little key hook to put right beside the door so that when I come in that door, I hang my keys up. And when I get ready to leave the door, I pick my keys up. And my keys now, I created order in my life where my keys are always, this morning, Kim said, you going to drive or am I going to drive? I said, I'm going to drive. I know where my keys are. And I can go get my key and get in my car, and I know I've created order in my life. Let me give you another example. Have you ever went and just straightened up the shoes in your closet or organized the clothes in your closet and get rid of some things that you don't wear, and you walk away and you feel like you can go conquer the world? Because you just organized your, you know why you feel that way? Because God is a God of order and God lives in you. And when you align those things, it, it, God smiles on order. <laughs> I know y'all not running aisles right now, but I'm preaching. God is a God of order. Amen. It's, here, here's an example. I mean, there was this one guy, listen closely. This one guy, he woke up, he ate breakfast, he, uh, he, he woke up, he got dressed, he, went, he ate breakfast, he went to work. Now follow that, watch that. He, that's, that makes sense. He woke up, he got dressed, he ate breakfast, he went to work. There was another guy, another guy. He woke up, he went to work, he ate breakfast, he got dressed. Both guys did the same thing. They did the four same things, they did it in different order. One guy got a promotion, the other guy got arrested. 
You understand? You can do the right things, but it not have order to it. And God is a God of order. So you, 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 you order your day. Amen. Understand, you order your day. So how do you do that as a Christian? Here, let me give them to you real quick. Number one, you, you order your day. But number one, you spend time with God in, in the Word and in prayer. Now listen, I'm going to tell you what I've disciplined myself to do. You know in the morning when I wake up, now I've got times throughout the day where I study, I pray, I do devotion, I prepare my sermon. But before I ever prepare sermon stuff, I, I prepare me. I preach out of the overflow. I, I fill myself up. That's how I get a sermon. I, I don't try to build a sermon. I fill myself up and I preach out of that overflow. But I get up in the morning. You know that moment when either the alarm clock goes off or if you're like me, I always beat my alarm clock up. And, and you start waking up, and you're kind of in that place where you're half asleep, you're half awake, and you're trying to figure out the difference between your dream and reality. You know, you're just trying to open your eyes. It's in that moment right there that I have learned, in that moment, I start talking to the Lord. Yeah, right there, first thing. Lord, thank you for waking me up. My heart's beating this morning. You got me up. You gave me another day. What a gift. And I'm not saying that out loud. I'm not hollering and yelling in that moment in prayer. But in my spirit, I'm talking to the Lord. And you know what? God will start talking back to you. First thing in the morning, when, when your mind is fresh, that's when you can talk to God. God will start talking back to you. And then I've got a thing on my phone before I check my email, before I check my text messages, before I look at Facebook or social media, any of that stuff. Every day I've got a thing set that at 4.30 in the morning every day, and I'm not up at 4.30, but it comes at 4.30, and it's a short devotion. So every morning when I pick my phone up, that's the first thing that's on my phone that I pick up. And I'll read that verse. I'll read that devotion. And that's how, before I ever, and I'll read the Bible some more. I'll pray some more. But that's the very first thing I do because it sets the course of my day. It puts things in order. The second thing that you need to do in your life to create order is you need to refresh. Come on, turn to somebody and say refresh. Some of y'all, some of y'all are, some of y'all are tired. Come on. I believe we ought to work hard, but you better rest hard too. I have people all the time tell me, Pastor, you go all the time. You're just wide open. But I'm going to tell you, there's some days where I just don't do anything. I'm going to be honest with you. I just, I'll schedule it where I'll take a day, I'll unplug to the best of my ability, and I, 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 know, how to, I know how to work hard and I know how to play hard. Come on, somebody. And here's the reason why, because I've learned tired eyes rarely see a bright future. And if you don't get proper rest for your body and your mind and your spirit, you become vulnerable for the attack of the enemy. You ever seen, when you're tired, you're grouchy? Come on, I saw about 20 men go like this. And then the women going like this right beside them. When you're tired, you're grouchy. Amen? When you're tired, you're grouchy. Somebody asked Kim the other day if she ever woke up grouchy. She says, no, I let them sleep late most of the time. <laughs> we wake up, we're irritable. We're irritable when we're tired. I've learned that when I'm tired, I'm going to tell you if God will let me today, the Sunday afternoon, so I don't ever tell you all this stuff, but I'm, I'm telling you all this. I'm going to tell you what happened today because I was up early this morning, and I don't know what it is about preaching. I mean, I've, 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 I've roofed houses. I've, I've worked in the, the potato fields when I was a kid. I, I've done every kind of hard work you can think of. I've done it, I, and I'm not whining. I love it, but I'm telling you this right here, Wears me out physically more than any job I've ever done. I don't know why. I can't figure it out. Joel, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, I don't understand. But I'll walk away from here today, and I'm going to be, because I'm going to lay it, I'm not going to leave anything on the table. I'm going to lay it all out here for y'all, everything I have, every source of energy. And then when I get in my truck in a minute, Kim will tell you, I'm going to have to drag myself in there. You know what I'm going to do? Because I've learned to do this. In a minute, I'm going to go home after I eat. And I take my wife out for Mother's Day, and I'm going to get in my chair, and I'm going to take me a nap. And you know why I'm going to do that? Because, Joel, the, the most vulnerable times I've ever had in my spirit, the most tempted I've ever been, the most weak moments I ever have is right after I preach. The enemy comes at me. That was terrible. You shouldn't have said that. You're not even called to do this. It don't matter. I've been doing it 28, 29 years. It doesn't matter. Because I'm tired. I'm weak. 
I'm vulnerable. And the enemy knows that's when he's going to attack me with everything that he has. That's the reason you got to know, you got to know when to pull apart. Even Jesus, the Bible said Jesus came apart from the multitude to rest. I'm talking about God. He come apart from the multitude to rest. Turn to somebody and say, you need some rest. Then number three, you got to reflect. You got to reflect. You got you, you got to look back and say, what was it that that worked well? And look at that and say, okay, let's do that again and let's do it better. What did not work well? And say, let's don't do that again. When I first came to this church, the deacons they the deacons they gathered around and they asked me, you know, what's your vision? Are there things you want to change? I said, well, here's my philosophy. I said, I don't have a vision because I just got here. I don't even know anybody's name. But I don't know if they remember, but this is what I told them. I said, here's my philosophy. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Why spend your energy trying to fix things that ain't broke? But if it's dead, bury it. It'll start stinking. Come on, somebody. So bury the, reflect, bury the things that are dead so they don't stink. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Amen? But de- reflect, manage those things. Then number four, look for a way to be a blessing. Find somebody you can bless. Amen. Just look for a way to be a blessing to somebody. If it's financially, if it's a word of encouragement, just be a blessing to somebody. God blessed you to be a blessing. Encourage somebody. Build them up. Man, every now and then I'll get a Facebook message or a a text or something that just says, Pastor, I'm praying for you. I appreciate you. I love you. And and y'all think that that doesn't matter. I'm telling you, when I get those, it changes my day. Amen. Because I believe you. Even if you're just sending it just to send it, I I believe what you're saying. And it makes me feel good. It makes me feel, I don't need affirmation, but it it makes you feel good to be a blessing to somebody. I told the church this morning, uh, it's been a year or so ago now, we do this, Kim and I try to do it on a regular basis, try to pay it forward. And I was in a fast food drive-thru. I just ordered me a coffee, about $2 coffee. And and I ordered it, I got up there to the window, they said the guy in front of me had paid for my coffee. I said, well, that's a blessing. I'm going to pay for the folks behind me. The lady at the window said, are you sure about that? I said, yeah. I mean, he bought mine. She said, yeah, but yours is $2. I said, well, how much is theirs? And they said something like $73. I said, my Lord, we're at McDonald's. What did they order for $73? I said, here, take my card. I gave it to her. I, and I, I'm just saying that to say sometimes the Lord will stretch you, you know? And I'm like, Okay. I said, I still, I said, I'd do it. Let's take care of it. And, uh, you know, and I went ahead and paid for it, and they gave me their meal, and it was delicious. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I'm just joking. No, I, I paid for it, and, and I, I mean, I know this sounds like preacher talk, but the truth is God made up for that. He made up for it. By the time that day was up, he made up for it. We went out to eat dinner with somebody, and they picked up the check. My bill was, it wasn't all that, but it was close. I mean, God, God's amazing, isn't he? You, you just, just do what he tells you to do. Just be a blessing. Amen? And then, and then look, for ways, look for ways to learn. Always be learning. You know, Evander Holyfield, he's, he's one of my favorite boxers. And Evander Holyfield said this, heavyweight champion of the world multiple times. He said, it's not getting knocked down that loses the fight. It's not getting back up. It's not getting knocked down that matters. It's not getting back up. So you've got to learn to get back up. Listen, you got to own your day. you got to order your day. Let me give you one more, and then I'm going to move through the rest of this quickly. Number, number three is you got to occupy your day. Can you say that, occupy your day? What that means is be all in. I just said rest, but be all in your day. Today's a gift. Find a place to serve. Make your life count. Make a contribution of your time, your talent, your treasure. Yeah, life is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get. But I know who's in my tomorrow. And if I know who's in my tomorrow, then I don't have to worry about whatever life brings. It doesn't matter. Bring it on. Amen. Because whatever comes my way, God is in the day. And this is the day that the Lord has made. Somebody say it with me. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Come on. Can we give the Lord praise for that today? Let me give you the second one, then I'm going to call the musicians up, and the third one is just my, my closing that I want to give you. The second one is this. It'll be quick. You've got to put your past before you. Mom always said, Forrest said, Mom always said, you've got to put the past behind you before you can move on. Well, Mama read the Bible because Philippians 3 says, 
brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting the things which are behind and reaching forth to the things that are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's a kid's movie that we watched one time, and in that movie there's a quote that says, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. God's given you, when he says we forget the things which are behind, it doesn't mean God gives you spiritual amnesia. It doesn't mean completely forget your history. It's just, listen to this closely. We, get, we glance into the past, we gaze into the future. When you get in your car today, there's, you're going to realize that there's two, wind, two pieces of glass in your car, your truck, your vehicle. The biggest piece of glass is your windshield. It's so you can see what's in front of you. The small piece of glass is a rear view mirror so you can glance what's behind you. You don't gaze in the rear view mirror, you glance. You don't glance through the windshield, you gaze. Matter of fact, everything about you was created to move forward, not to move backward. You ever thought about that? You ever notice that your eyes are in the front of your head so you can see what's ahead of you? Your ears are positioned to hear what's in front of you. Your, your nose is positioned to smell what's in front of you. Your mouth is created to project into your future. Look at your hands. Your hands are created to reach out in front of you. Your feet are created to move you forward. You may can run backwards, but you can't run as fast as you can forward because everything about you was created to cause you to advance into what God has created for you in your future. As a matter of fact, take just a minute. Look all the way over your left shoulder. Would you do that? Look all the way. Now look all the way back over your right shoulder. Come on, would you do that? Now, some of y'all look and don't know your left from your right. Y'all all over the place. Look over both shoulders. Now look ahead. Now don't ever look back again. What are you looking back for? And here's the problem. It's not just the bad things because mostly you'd preach this and you'd say, you know, you've got to forget all those bad things that are behind you because the Apostle Paul who wrote this, man, he had a, he had a history. He was a persecutor of Christians. He, was, he called himself the chief of all sinners. But you know what he was saying? Don't look back at all that. And because Paul refused to look back, the Bible, said, the Bible tells us and reveals he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. This guy who was just as jacked up as you can be jacked up, God took him, redeemed him, and used him to write the very scripture that I'm using to preach to you today. If God can do that for him, he can do it for you, but he won't do it if you keep looking back. Listen, there is now, therefore, no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus that walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. I don't care how bad you were. I don't care what you did. Your sins were thrown as far as the east is from the west, never more to be remembered. It is forgiven, forgotten. Stop living in your past. God has a future for your life. If you stay hung up in that, you're never going to walk into what God has for you. My Lord in heaven, we've all got a past. I've got so much, if I looked at my past and my resume and my bow and my history, I would think I was the most likely to fail, the least likely to succeed at anything. But I'm going to tell you, you've got to look at God and understand that if God can do it for me, he can do it for you. If he can do it for them, he can do it for you. God cares about you. He has a plan for your life. Quit living in your past. And not only the bad things, but some of us, we get caught up in the good things. I'm going to tell you the hardest part of pastoring over the last 30 years, for me, trying to cast vision, and look into the future, and dream about what God can do, is people who get hung up on the victories of the past. Not the bad things, the good things. And God blessed us, and it's like we got it, and got over it, and all we want to talk about or the trophies. And if we're not careful, what is supposed to be a movement will turn into a monument. And the only thing monuments are good for is pigeon droppings. 
I don't want to become a movement, or a monument, rather. I want to be a movement. You know, I, I didn't say this in the first service, but I've, I've told this story before. It's a true story. In, in, in one of the, in Sudan, in one of the most ravaged parts of Africa, there was a place where there used to be pro, a little bit of prosperity. And this is a true story told by Livingstone, that there was a, a zoo that was there. And in this zoo, in this zoo there were animals, you know, just like any zoo. You'd walk through this zoo and you'd see the monkeys in the cage and they'd be swinging and playing and having a good time. You'd see the apes, you'd see the gorilla, you'd see the giraffes, the zebras, the lion that would roar. And it would ring throughout the entire zoo. Y'all been to zoos, you know how it is. Well, the strange thing about this zoo was a famine had hit the land. War, famine, poverty. And so the zoo was still there, and there was a guide at the zoo. The cages were still there. The monkey swings were still there. The lion cage was still there. It was all still there. The only problem was there were no animals there because the animals had been killed for food. And so you'd walk through this zoo, and the guide would take you through the zoo, and he'd say, right here is where the monkeys used to be. And the monkeys would swallow. Oh, it was so funny to watch them play together. And they'd, they'd swing from tree to tree. Over here is where the lions used to be. And man, when that lion, the king of the jungle, would roar. And then the elephants were over here. And you could watch the elephants. They would play. They had a ball that they would toss around to each other in there. It's where they used to be. When I heard that story, I thought, you know, if we're not careful because of the lack of vision, that's what the church becomes. And all we talk about is how Sister Susie used to shout right over here. Right over here. I remember, man, revival would hit, and she'd shout. She'd dance that aisle right there. I've heard the stories. Sister so-and-so over here, man, the power of God would hit. She'd just jump up and down. I can tell you those stories. I've got them all. I grew up in church. And if we're not careful, all we do is tell the stories of what used to exist. I'm going to stop and tell you something. I'm a grandfather now. I've got some kids coming up in this thing. Had two of them with us the last three weeks. I laid my hands on those kids. I prayed for them. And I pray, God, I pray don't let them just hear the stories of revival. Let them see revival. I don't want to be a tour guide that just tells them about what used to be. I want them to experience it right now. And I don't want to get so, when I talk about revival, I, I know it's easy for us to talk about 1963 and 1975 and not to, for me, 1990. And to talk about those moments. And I don't mind us glancing back at those moments, but let's don't get to gazing in that. Forget the things which are behind and say, God, I need your power now. I need the glory to fall in this generation. I need the move of God to happen right now. Come on, somebody help me in this house this morning. Forget the things which are behind. And then the last one is this. Last one's this. I've got a lot more preaching there, but let me get to this last one. This third one and final one, Morris said, Mom always said, dying is a part of life. I wish it wasn't. Hebrews 9, 27 in the Amplified Version says, And just as it is appointed and destined for all men to die once, and after this, Come certain judgment. There's a shocking statistic that I discovered. 99.9999999999999% of people die. You say, Pastor, isn't that 100%? Well, there's two in the Bible, Enoch and Elijah. So it creates a little. But other than Enoch and Elijah, 100 out of 100, even Jesus died, he rose again. Lazarus died, he was resurrected. You're gonna, if the Lord tarries, it's coming. From the youngest in this room to the oldest in this room, we're going to die. Mama always said, dying is a part of life. I wish it wasn't. Well, that's the one thing I break from Forrest Mama on. Now, dying is a part of life, that's true. But she says, I wish it wasn't. No, I understand that there's, there's this, this reality 
through Christ about death that changes everything. Well, I'm not afraid to die. Dying's not a big deal. Now, I'm not ready to check out today necessarily. I want to see my grandkids grow. But, but dying's a part of life, but, but here's the reality of it. I mentioned at the beginning of this message, and I don't, I don't mean to make this sad. Just stay with me for a moment. But my mom passed away June 27th of last year, unexpectedly. She had the stroke. Two days later, she was with the Lord. I believe she was actually with the Lord before that machine quit working. And uh, there was nothing left undone. I had a wonderful relationship with my mother. We said our goodbyes. and She was able to respond with squeezing of a hand, and I know she heard us, and we all said goodbye, told her we loved her, said, Mom, it's, it's all good. You raised, raised us right, and we're so thankful and grateful. And I release you. Go be with the Lord. And uh, so that's been since June. And I'm being very transparent with you as I was the first service. But I love you enough that I'm bearing my soul with you. And many of you in here have experienced that. Some of you, this may be the first Mother's Day without your mom. And so Friday, I was preparing this message, and I was looking up all these stories and illustrations about moms, getting ready to preach this sermon. Man, the more I read that, I started thinking about my mom, and I thought about the whole journey. I thought about, we drove by the other day where I started first grade, and I remember from elementary to first grade, we changed schools. My dad started pastoring a church when I was in first grade, and we changed, we moved. And I remember the first day we drove by that school the other day. They were tearing it down. And I knew they were tearing it down. Someone would drive by, and I, I drove through there. And I'm 54 years old, and it's like my mind, Julianne, it's like my mind went back to that day, that first day of school. My mom pulled in that little place and let me out. And I remember crying for my mama. I remember it like it was yesterday. I remember so many times when my dad died, my mom raised my brother and my sister and I. I was 12, 10, 5, the sacrifices she made, working three jobs, trying her best to provide for our family. I've told you stories about how hard things got. I thought about all that. And man, I have not mourned like I and grieved like I did Friday. Not even, I preached my mom's funeral. And I didn't grieve like I did Friday. This past Friday, Kim picked up on it and she she had some things to do, and she said, you want to go with me? And I said, not really. I think I'm going to stay here and just work on my sermon. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, this big old boy cried all day. I missed my mama. I wanted to call her, and I couldn't. I wanted to talk to her about this Sunday, and I couldn't. I wanted to tell her about my grandkids, and I couldn't. And then I started thinking about it, and I, and I needed that. Honestly, you need those moments. There's a time to mourn. There's a time to rejoice. And I'm going to tell you, I don't care how John Wayne you are, <laughs> a boy and his mama. And uh, so I, I just began to process it all, and I thought about heaven. And I said, Lord, I'm so thankful for the promise of heaven. I'm so thankful that when I leave this earth, I'll get to see them all again. There's not a question or doubt in my mind. I know I'm on my way to heaven. I know I'm on my way to heaven. I know my mom's in heaven. But my mind went back to the funeral home. You know, I'm the preacher in the family, and my brother and sister, and everybody was gathered around. My mom, Kim, was, Kim was such a blessing to my mom in her last hours. And I remember... I remember uh, being at the funeral home at the visitation, and uh, I had a friend. They were friends of ours because we, we grew up in church together, and this family, they had three sons, and our family, there was me, my brother, and my sister, and we were all the same age as those kids, and this lady, she's passed on as well. She was my mom's best friend, and, and those kids, we were just so tight. I mean, we'd stay at each other's house. We'd go out to eat after church on Sunday night. I mean, we were just really close families. And uh, I had not seen him in 20 years, but, but one of the sons that I was friends with, one I was closest to, he came to the funeral home, and 
I'd not seen him in 20 years. He's an engineer for DuPont. And uh, just brilliant, really wonderful guy. He come up. I was so glad to see him. And like so many of you, if you've ever been at a funeral home, you know people, they say all kinds of things trying to comfort you. And, and you know, I've heard people say, I don't want to hear any of that. There's no words that I need to hear. I'm not that way. Everybody that came to me, I listened because I knew everything they were saying to me. Some of the things I'd said before, you know, and I knew some of it was cliches, but I knew that they cared about me and they were giving me comfort and grace. And I, I listened to every, and I appreciated and cherished everything everybody said. But there was this friend who came up to me and he said, David, he said, I want you just to remember something. He said, and I don't know, this that I'm about to tell you, out of everything that was said, this got into me. And Friday, it's like it rebounded right back at me. And the Holy Spirit said, just remember this. And here's what he told me. He said, David, your mom didn't stop living. She just stopped dying. I said, say that again. He said, your mom didn't stop living. She just stopped dying. Because I'm going to tell you. If, if, if it's a heart attack or whatever and you hear that David Smith died, I'm like Billy Graham said. Don't you believe a word of that? Because I died in 1988 in an old-fashioned altar. When I knelt down and I gave Jesus my heart, the old man passed away, and behold, all things become new. And because I've been regenerated, I've been changed, I'm never going to die. Come on, somebody. This old body may quit working. But from the moment I was born, from the moment you were born, you started dying. These babies, as precious as they are and as new as they are, we just saw our brand new grandson. <laughs> they were born. The very day they were born, they started the process that we all start of dying. This body. We're a soul that possesses a spirit that lives in a body. This old body is going to quit working one of these days, but our soul is eternal. We're going to spend eternity somewhere. So far as mom says, dying is just a part of life, I wish it wasn't. No, if you're a believer, you're not going to die. You're just going to start living. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And when I take that last breath on this side of eternity, I'm taking my first step on streets of gold. Jesus is there. And this old body that every day when I look in the mirror, my beard gets grayer, my hair gets thinner, my crow's feet turned into buzzard's feet. Come on. Bags under my eyes that I have to... Kim said, there's stuff you can do for that. Listen, you can blow it out, suck it out. You're still aging. You're still dying. Come on. That's the reality. But you don't, you don't, you don't have to die. You can have the promise of eternal life in Christ Jesus. To know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But if you don't know Jesus, I sure wish it wasn't. But I know him. Do you know him? Do you know without a doubt? Do you know without question, without a doubt, that Jesus is coming? Because listen, tomorrow is promised to no man. I said tomorrow is promised to no man and no woman. It may, this could be the day. You don't, you're not promised you're going to wake up tomorrow. You're not promised you're going to make it through today. I've preached as many funerals for people under 50 as I have over 50. you got to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And when you know, you can have this. I, I don't understand why we fight it so hard. The devil's a liar. He wants to convince you that it's not worth it, that it's too hard. No, 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 no. This is not about religion. It's about having a relationship with Jesus. It's not about church and all, all of this is great. It's wonderful. But I'm telling you, he wants you to have a relationship with him so you can know that you've been redeemed by the blood and you can spend eternity in heaven. 
Listen, today, and I'm done. As a matter of fact, you can stand with me. If, if you came to church today with your mom, I'm sure she appreciates that. If you take her out to eat so she doesn't have to prepare a meal today, I'm sure she's going to appreciate that. Buy her a gift. That's going to be a blessing to her. The greatest thing you can do for anybody is to give them the assurance that you're going to spend eternity in heaven with them. We hope that you enjoyed this message. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our channel for all the latest sermons and content from Oak Park Church. If you would like to help invest into and expand the ministry of OPC, you can do so by giving at opcmobile.org forward slash give. If you made the decision to make Christ your Lord and Savior, be sure to share that news with someone. Whether it be a friend or a family member, let them know. You can also let us know by clicking the link below. We would love to pray for you and send you some materials to help you with your new walk with Christ. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to the OPC family.